Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. So Bitcoin slipping more overnight, guys. Uh, Bitcoin right now is trading at eighteen thousand seven hundred dollars. Look at that. We're getting very close to this inter-year low that we saw back in uh, June on June eighteenth, seventeen thousand five. So Bitcoin really only has to drop another one thousand dollars, roughly twelve hundred dollars, approximately to get down to that low and then breaking, piercing that level. Who knows if it will happen and who knows how low it could go from there. You know, some people, including myself, are suggesting that uh, if it does pierce that level, we will retrace all the way back to this former level of resistance from back in mid-2019. It's a twofold argument because, um, you know, that's the next logical resting place. Old resistance would become new support. And also, you know, in the past, we have seen Bitcoin corrections uh, of about 80 to 85 percent and that would bring us down to roughly 80 percent so we haven't pierced it yet so i'm not calling it but we have seen a bit of a crypto market collapse we've seen money withdraw from the market right now the market cap is sitting at about 940 billion and within the last 24 hours we saw uh declines in some of the top cryptocurrencies like bitcoin down 5.8 percent uh ethereum's down about nine percent we've got uh, binance coin down 6.3 xrp down almost four percent Cardano uh, down 7.6%. So, you know, some of the top cryptocurrencies have seen some declines, not huge. Luckily, we haven't seen double digit declines, but these are still declines nonetheless. Um, so we got to keep our eye on that. Of course, XRP right now trading at about 32.2. So, you know, and it's in line with, um, you know, with the average of what we've been seeing for declines in the space. A good time to accumulate more cryptocurrency. Like I mentioned, I had purchased uh, one stack of Algorand. I think it was a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, you know, I'm waiting for that next big move. So I put 50% of my capital in at that time. And I'm keeping 50% on the sidelines in case we do see this next big move to the downside. So, you know, uh, my philosophy is this. If it goes down good, if it doesn't go down, that's fine too. I mean, I've accumulated a lot over this bear market. So my bags are packed. My targets had not been hit. Uh, for many of my cryptocurrencies, I did make some trades in the last bull run, like my Binance coin trade bought at $24.00 sold near all-time high, just over $600. So I was happy with that particular trade. Of course, my XRP didn't hit my expectations, so I'm still holding on to my bag of XRP. And during that time, I picked up some other altcoins, like Algorand is one of the big ones. A WEF coin, it's got a lot of potential, solves problems. Uh, and so th that's my point. I already hold quite a bit of cryptocurrency, so plunging in with 50% of my capital uh, a couple of weeks ago was okay for me. Um, and I'm just waiting for new lows. If I see new lows, great, I will deploy the final 50%. And if I don't, that's okay too. Anyway, I'm gonna move along here, guys. Uh, Makatech XRP pointing this out with regards to possibly a new corridor for Ripple's on-demand liquidity service. This has to do with the Canadian-Mexican corridor. So Ripple ODL partner to facilitate cross-border remittances from Canada to Mexico in a new partnership. Now, the exchange that they mention here is Bitso. They've already been a Ripple ODL partner for quite some time, and now they're partnering with AfriChange to facilitate cross-border settlements between Mexico and Canada. Uh, they've successfully processed cross-border payments worth $70 million from Canada to Nigeria already, with AfriChange seeking to expand its services to Mexico. The company partnered with Bitso, thus allowing remittances to be sent from Canada to Mexico. So another potential corridor here, moving money, adding more value to the XRPL in the meantime. According to the announcement, there's been a growing population of Mexicans who live and work in Canada due to the massive job opportunities in the country. As of 2020, nearly 130,000 Mexicans reside in Canada with the number skyrocketing in the last two years. So there has been more immigration into Canada since the pandemic. Commenting on the development was the uh, senior product manager over there at AfriChange. And she said that by leveraging the blockchain and partnering with Bitso, one of the biggest cryptocurrency platforms in Latin America, we aim to provide a cross-border exchange experience that's seamless, cheap, and fast. All those talking points that, uh, you know, Ripple uses to describe the XRP ledger. And, you know, it's no surprise to us that they are seamless, cheap, and fast, considering they are using Bitso for on-demand liquidity. So great news there. Wanted to thank Mac Attack XRP just for posting that. Mike Manfield here bringing us some more Ripple partner news. So apparently, two Ripple-enabled banks, okay? One of them is Yes Bank, and the other one, I believe, yeah, it's Axis Bank here. So these are two Ripple-enabled banks. Yes Bank in particular has signed an MOU with India's Gift City. So India's first operational smart city and international financial services center has announced that it has signed a memorandum of understanding with Yes Bank to strengthen the fintech ecosystem in Gift City. As part of the MOU, Gift City and Yes Bank plan to promote 
fintech innovation and a fintech accelerator for encouraging, promoting, and supporting fintech startups. Also, the MOU entails conductive programs, uh, or sorry, conducting programs related to the international financial services, promoting Gift City as a fintech hub in India, and exposing young investors in the fintech domain to opportunities in India. So, Gift City and Yes Bank will collaborate to organize roadshows, seminars, knowledge series webinars and or conferences for creating awareness on the Gift City fintech regime and promoting Gift City as the fintech hub of India to house fintech startups and new market participants. So a smart city in India specifically. Uh, I don't know where Access Bank is mentioned here, although uh, Mike Manfield here does also mention Access Bank. Let's go back to this for a second here. Here's the CEO of Yes Bank, Prashant uh, Kumar. He said Yes Bank IFSC banking unit is extremely pleased to further strengthen its strategic partnership with Gift City, having been the first bank to go live at Gift in October of 2015. The bank has continuously invested in expanding its IBU franchise with considerable balance sheets uh, and intellectual capital. We are now extremely delighted to collaborate with Gift City on this highly strategic initiative to enable the startup ecosystem to leverage the world-class infrastructure, fiscal and other incentives provided by Gift City. So yes, Bank Ripple enabled. Uh, I don't see where Access Bank is mentioned in here, although um, they're both Ripple partners nonetheless. And in this particular case, enabling a new smart city in India. So uh, interesting news there. I wanted to thank Mike Manfield for posting that. Wrath of Kahneman here bringing us this news. Storage size of the XRPL grows by apparently 12 gigabytes per day. Did you guys know that? And 12 gigabytes, that's actually not that much. It just goes to show you guys how efficient the development is on uh, some of these blockchains. So a key concern, so this is just kind of describing how um, blockchains do grow in size. A key concern when applying blockchain is its data storage requirement. So it's two reasons. XRPL, very efficient, but a lot is now being developed on the XRPL. So we're specifically seeing a uh, storage volume increase. Uh, this goes on to say specifically all blocks are replicated and stored in fully functional nodes aka full nodes, and as a result, full nodes require a large storage space. Although I don't actually think 12 gigabytes is that big, uh, you know, considering we, we work in the terabytes in some cases, and even bigger, I mean, I'm always looking for more hard drive space. For example, in Bitcoin, the storage requirement of a full node is approximately 380 gigabytes. And that was at the beginning of 2022, which is an increase of about 20% as compared to its size in 2021. Another example is the blockchain Ripple, where its storage size grows by 12 gigabytes per day and its entire blockchain size exceeds 14 terabytes as of 2022. So the entire blockchain exceeding 14 terabytes still has a lot of room to grow, um, but I would have thought that these blockchains were much, much larger. Consequently, the significant storage cost required by blockchain limits its scalability and leads to fewer full nodes or centralization. Interesting to note though, that it is growing at a rate of 12, roughly 12 gigabytes per day. And this is before XLS-20D as uh, as mentioned here by Wrath of Kahneman. So it's going to be interesting once, uh, you know, there is more development on the XRPL, how much uh, or, or what new products are going to be built on there, uh, what new services are going to be built on there. And then when it explodes, when utility explodes, how big the XRPL can really get. And if that number is actually going to grow uh, at a higher rate than it is today. Anyway, some uh, an interesting little tidbit of news here from the Wrath of Kahneman. XRP Crypto Wolf bringing this to our attention. So a new payment solution update, speaking of developments on the XRPL, an update to a new payment solution uh, was just announced. So as has become known, the Apex XRPL Developer Summit taking place over the next two days in Las Vegas will feature a number of new XRP payment solutions. Specifically, according to the statements of well-known XRPL Labs developer Vitz Vind, and Dominique Blossma, the forum will present an XRP payments and refund solution that uses pathfinding technology. Vitzvin actually uh, tweeted this out the other day. Was it yesterday? Yeah, it was yesterday here. Pathfinding, pay with anything to deliver what the store owner wants to receive. And they've actually uh, included a refund uh, capability in there as well. And we'll show you how. So uh, apparently uh, this guy here, Dominique Blossma, he is the e-commerce and POS for XRPL Labs. And he had a hand in this as well. This XRPL Labs innovation provides quick pathfinding where a user pays with XRP and a merchant receives the cryptocurrency that is a priority for him or her. In addition, the XRPL Labs team responsible for some wallet developers from NOP Commerce, an open source e-commerce platform, have had a hand in working on this new XRP payment solution. So it sounds as though uh, a lot more is going to be unveiled in Las Vegas. This event is hosted by Ripple specifically. 
and uh, it is meant for the developers, current uh, or sorry, co-founder and current CTO David Schwartz, as well as former head developer Matt Hamilton, will be on stage as speakers at what is probably the largest forum devoted to XRP and the XRPL ledger. And so uh, I've already seen photos uh, over there on Twitter with uh, people, developers, uh, I guess, posing with David Schwartz at this event. So it's ongoing right now. I don't know if it's, um, I mean, it's probably wrapped up by now, but you know, a good summit here, a new um, conference, I guess, just demonstrating all the new possibilities and uh, the new developments that are being developed on the XRPL ledger. Anyway, wanted to thank XRP Crypto Will for pointing that out. And Ashley Prosper here, persevering with her Freedom of Information Act request from the SEC after appealing the fees applied to the SEC FOIA office. I have received the below response. They want to know what I plan to do with the requested info. So she requested an FOIA and they said uh, the information related to communications JP Morgan and the SEC during this time period, 2013 to 2018. You also requested a fee waiver. And so they granted her a fee waiver and uh, they placed her in another category other use fee category. On August 29th, 2022, you filed this appeal challenging the FOIA officer's decision to deny your fee waiver request and to place you in the other use fee category. I have considered your appeal and I am remanding the matter for further review. In both your appeal and request, you reference the public's need to obtain the information you seek. However, it is not clear how you intend to use the records you seek based on the statements contained in your uh, FOIA request and appeal and the FOIA office did not inquire about your intentions before classifying you as an other use requester. Although not required, Office of Management and Budget fee guidelines encourages agencies to seek additional information for clarification from a requester when the intended use is not clear from the FOIA. So they are asking Ashley here what she intends to use this for uh, because they're putting her in this, uh, this separate category here. Um, but my guess is if you are just going to disseminate it over Twitter and uh, perhaps online on other forums, uh, that's free to go. You're not looking to profit off this. And so, you know, they probably just want, uh, you know, some kind of clarification and some agreement that you aren't uh, going to be selling the information at hand here. But boy, man, you got to jump through hoops in order to get this. Uh, thanks, Ashley, so much for uh, just keeping us up to date on this because XRP hodlers, I think uh, we deserve to know. And you know, it, it, I gotta get, I gotta give credit to the people out there doing the work and bringing us back all the information with regards to the uh, legalities, the the legal, the lawsuit specifically, and also just uncovering all this other stuff that we've uh, kind of you know learned over the years about the SEC uh, in our workings. We have now, as the XRP community, coined the term ETHgate. Uh, LOL, that's insane. That they think. They have the right to ask you what you will do with it. Ashley Prosper said, I thought it sounded a bit weird, but I'm going to tell them I plan to publish it on Twitter for public access, as well as send copies to journalists, congressmen, influencers, and public entities like Empower and Crypto Law. So Ashley Prosper here fighting the good fight. Wanted to thank her for posting that. And James K. Filan also keeping us up to date on a new schedule. So this is a brand new schedule update, guys. Uh, as of yesterday afternoon, September the 6th, so, you know, we've gone through some of this. We talked about these dates that have now passed us by. Uh, we are now coming up to September 9th. That's only a couple of days away. That would be this Friday, I guess. The motions to seal portions of the oppositions have already been fully briefed. By any motions to seal portions of the exclusion motion replies uh, must be filed by September 9th. And any response to these motions uh, to seal must be filed by September the 16th. So with regards to the DPP and attorney-client privilege battle over the Hinman documents, the decision on the SEC's objection is still pending, guys, on the DPP. This matter is fully briefed and we are awaiting a decision by District Judge Torres. DPP appeal or petition to the Second Circuit. So there's also that if the SEC loses the privilege issues before Judge Torres, there's a chance that the SEC would try to file an interlocutory or interlocutory, excuse me, appeal to the Second Circuit. Before they do that, they would have to file a motion uh, of certification of an inlocutory appeal with District Judge Torres. Unfortunately, that takes time. For example, the last time the SEC filed such a motion before District Judge Torres in a different case, and then they talk about the Rio Tinto case, it took almost 10 weeks from the original ruling until District Judge Torres decided whether to certify the issue for appeal to that case. So guys, uh, it still could take time. Uh, this goes on. I will link this in the description if you guys want to read the full thing. But here's some dates that are coming up. So motions for summary judgment, motions for summary judgment, and uh, Rule 56.1 statement of undisputed facts must be filed by the 13th of September. Uh, and then oppositions to the motion for summary judgment and responses to the rule statement must be filed by October 18th, 
2022, and replies to those must be filed by uh, November 15th, 2022. He makes a note here, so this coming directly from James K. Filan. Just like the expert challenge motions, please keep in mind that there will most likely be similar sealing disputes regarding what will be sealed and what will be public in connection with the motions for summary judgment. Therefore, it is my expectation that the summary judgment motions will be filed under seal on September the 13th, 2022, at least preliminarily, until either uh, Judge Torres works out what uh, can be filed publicly and what will remain under seal, or the parties otherwise agree on the sealing issues. I'm sticking to my prediction that District Judge Torres will decide both the expert motions and the summary judgment motions at the same time, on or before, and so his deadline here, his prediction, still March 31st, 2023. I have no prediction on when the Hinman email dispute will be fully and finally Resolved. So guys, we're still looking at March 31st, 2023. Interesting, down here we've got Leroy asking a question. Thank you for all you do. I do have one question. Can the judge move forward with summary judgment without the possibility of DPP appeal not being settled? So we heard down here that, uh, you know, th this could take some time and it has taken up to 10 weeks in the, uh, in the SEC versus Rio Tinto case, for example. But can the judge actually uh, rule on something without that decision? And James K. Filan responds, yes, in fact, the parties anticipated that could actually happen. So the parties are to submit a proposed summary judgment schedule on April 22nd, 2022, and after meeting and conferring with defendants, the SEC understands that they do not object to proceeding to summary judgment without final resolution of their motion challenging certain of the SEC's privilege assertions. So not only are they saying that, uh, or rather, not only is James K. Filan saying that it could happen, in fact, they are anticipated that it could happen based on this uh, based on this statement here. So wanted to thank James K. Filan, of course, for all the updates with regards to the Ripple SEC lawsuit and just giving his point of view too, right? You know, having these uh, Ripple XRP lawyers, I guess I like to call them, on crypto Twitter with the XRP community, I think it's given us um, a lot more... Uh, it's put us a lot more at ease over the last two years or so. We're really drilling down, uh, and not only are we getting good information from good sources and, uh, you know, uh, professionals, professional lawyers here, you know, bringing us said information, we're also uncovering more, and we're discovering more, and it's kind of empowering the XRP community to do more, I think. One prime example, ETHgate, you know, despite the fact that I am sick and tired of talking about this lawsuit, uh, you know, it is uncovering more, and it is interesting to know Who's in bed with who? Speaking of which, let this sink in. The people meeting with the SEC behind closed doors and crafting what could become the SEC's policy were invested in the assets they were working to get an SEC free pass from. Now, just yesterday, I did a video with Lee Schneider suggesting that, uh, you know, they put together some framework, proposed it to the SEC, and the SEC was open to the new framework. And if you guys didn't catch that video, I will link it up here in the top right hand corner. Well, Digital Asset Buy here, he's just retweeting a tweet. He tweeted out yesterday. In the video below, Nerd Nation Unbox shows us that Lee Schneider, who was an attorney at McDermott, Will and Emery at the time of ETHgate apparently helped write the Safe Harbor memo that became the ETH free pass. And he owned BTC at the time. What about Ethereum? It's just a 27 second clip. Listen to this. Uh, look, I don't know. I wrote a paper on the subject. Um, for, for Coinbase. Um, I don't know if that's where you got your pricing from today, but it definitely went below 7,000 today. Yeah. I've watched my Coinbase account nearly halve in value over the past five weeks. It was all over the place. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, I was sort of feeling pretty wealthy at the beginning of January. I'm feeling much poorer today. <laughs> Wait till tomorrow. Uh, yeah, indeed. <laughs> so he jokes about his Coinbase account. Uh, he owned Bitcoin. Did he own... Ethereum, well, gotta hand it to Wheezy at Nerd Nation Unbox here. It is confirmed Lee Schneider did hold Bitcoin and Ethereum. And apparently this is from a, uh, a podcast here, special episode on Coinbase from back in July of 2017. Lee Schneider on the episode talking about Coinbase and coincidentally his holdings. I'm glad to hear that uh, your onboarding experience was a smooth one, Lee. And I'm glad to have bought some Bitcoin and Ether a month ago before the current run up. So... <laughs> Congratulations. I'm not able to retire on it yet, but... Uh, well, we're I'm... headed there. We're headed there. So Lee Schneider admitting he did buy Bitcoin and Ethereum while writing the Safe Harbor memo that became the Ethereum free pass. Another piece to the puzzle has been added. That's just my opinion, but I want to hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.